Hello all and welcome to our first fireside chat of the day. Um, this might be a little different than some of the other uh, fireside events that you've been seeing because we've got two esteemed um, uh, representatives here. Uh, I am Skylar Dalton. I'm a first year student at the Tuck School of Business and I'm joined by Kevin Lockett who's a partner at Fulcrum Global Capital and Brett Wong who's a principal at Antara Capital. Um, and today we will be having a discussion about the future and the current and the what and the why of um, the agriculture venture capital space. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to uh, my my friends who introduced themselves. So Brett, I'd love if you could just tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're here. All right, sorry. Um, no worries. Even after all, all this whole year, I still can't figure out how to use these things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to be here. My name's Brett Wong, as mentioned, I'm with Antara Capital. Um, personally, I, I grew up in Colorado, made my way out to Boston, still a Colorado elitist, which my wife hates, um, but <clears throat> what are you gonna do about it? Um, and my family's been involved in agriculture. Uh, we own farmland, we've had dairy farms, uh, greenhouse production or controlled environment, if you will. Um, you know, we've been operating in the cannabis space, specifically on the testing side. Um, so my family has been involved in, in agriculture for a very long time. Uh, I am a chemical biotech engineer by background. I started my career building ethanol plants and working on second gen biofuels, trying to turn corn into ethanol uh, or cellulosic, um, the corn stover into ethanol. That never really went anywhere, as, as everybody knows, uh, but then went over to the dark side of finance, was on Wall Street in, in equity research um, for almost eight years, where I covered all agriculture names public and then took a lot of the names that are relatively new public. Um, and then decided that the, the public markets were <clears throat> not as fun as, as the private ones. And so um, made it made a jump into the early stage investing and, and hence here with with Antara. Great, and I'll pass it over to you, Kevin, to do a little bit of the same. Yeah, so uh, as mentioned, I'm Kevin Lockett with uh, Fulcrum Global Capital. And uh, so uh, ag doesn't come as easy to me as it does to Brett. I did not grow up uh, on a farm, but uh, I have been investing in the ag space for the last eight or nine years. Um, but I've been in the early stage space for uh, probably the last 20 years. So um, spent about a decade in management consulting uh, with uh, primarily on early stage companies and uh, got into the ag space in terms of early stage investing uh, about seven, about eight years ago. And uh, then we got into Fulcrum about three years ago. So we're in our first fund and I'm sure we'll go into more detail about all of that. Uh, but uh, by training, I'm a finance uh, and accounting type of guy. Uh, but I've been in ag now for the past eight years, so I have uh, I know enough to be dangerous. Let's say that. Great, thank you. And um, because you just uh, kind of alluded to it, I'd love to start with you, Kevin, to hear a little bit more about your fund and would love kind of the background on Fulcrum. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, Fulcrum uh, Global Capital, uh, this is our first fund. Uh, the three of us, there's three of us that are general partners. Uh, we've been together now for eight years as a team, uh, even though Fulcrum is only three years old. So prior to Fulcrum, uh, we worked at an organization where we were the leadership that was responsible for uh, investing uh, in venture, uh, specifically in ag and animal health and a little bit of human health uh, on behalf of the state of Kansas. And so uh, we built up a portfolio there uh, over about a five year period. Uh, and then we decided to uh, spin out and go start Fulcrum. So uh, our fund isn't as big as uh, Brett's at Intera. We're about $36 million fund, uh, but we typically invest uh, at the Series A stage. Uh, our thesis is really built around global food production, so it's sort of broad. Uh, but what that really means for us is we're interested in technologies uh, that are either increasing food production, uh, increasing food safety, or 
uh, decreasing food waste. So starting to get at some of the inefficiencies throughout the supply chain in, in food and ag. Um, one of the intriguing pieces about us, and I know we'll get to this, is, is our investor base. Uh, so about 70% of our uh, investors are actual innovative farmers. Uh, and so that, that we believe gives us sort of some unique insight at times uh, into deals because uh, we're specifically looking at technologies that are more upstream. So closer to the farmer as opposed to uh, closer to the uh, consumer. So um, we're based in Kansas City. Uh, we probably done about nine deals out of this first fund. We'll do one more and then, uh, we'll probably look to go hit the market and see if we can be su successful at, uh, at raising a second fund. Great. Thank Great. you. Thank and you. I would love to hear about, uh, and Tara. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the, the fun things about, uh, and, and Kevin and I have known each other for a bit now, um, looking at opportunities in this space, but one of the fun things about agriculture and, and early stage investing in this space is it's very collaborative versus other industries. And, and that really comes as a result of all of us needing to work together because there just isn't enough capital. There's not enough inflows of capital into such a critical space, which yes, is always surprising, but is the reality. Um, and, and so in order to kind of continue to drive all the innovation that's really needed, we all work together very closely. Um, so it's very collaborative, which which is a lot of fun. But but one of the fun things too with you know, Kevin and, and Fulcrum ultimately and Antares is, is we're very different um, funds in terms of the, the way that we're structured, if you will, um, and really based off of our LP base. Um, so we're, we're all institutional. Um, we don't have any strategic investments, um, which, you know, has, has been an interesting kind of aspect of, of our fund. Um, we're very close with strategics and ultimately have worked with the strategics through um, partnership agreements or consulting agreements, um, but none of them are, are LPs for us. Um, and ultimately, we're on our second fund, um, actually in the process of, of a, a second close for, for the second fund. Um, but we have $350 million, um, AUM, and our first fund was backed purely by Fidelity, the big asset manager here in Boston, which is where I'm based, and uh, Rabobank, which is the leading ag bank out of the Netherlands. Um, in our second fund, those two have cornerstoned again, um, but we have brought a couple of other institutional investors around around them, um, which was was always the plan to kind of expand the people around the table. And, and we've got great relationships with our LPs and, and really see the benefit of, of kind of looking at this space and co-investing. And we can talk about some of those things later. Um, but but we, we have kind of two strategies at Antero. One traditional venture investing, um, like Kevin mentioned, we look at similar stage of investments, looking at series A's, um, series B's, A's are really kind of the sweet spot. Uh, we, we have the flexibility given our ownership structure to really play anywhere. But the problem is that prices get just way out of control. <laughs> I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. Um, and so actually, because of that, we've, we've been driven a bit earlier even looking at more seed rounds than, than we probably have in the past. Um, and, you know, the other, and that's also led to the other side of, of our house, if you will. Um, and we're a small team, so we all do it all, but uh, we've been incubating out of Intera. So we've been doing venture creation um, and we've started five businesses out of the Intera office where ultimately our venture partners um, kind of help us create an idea and then they become the CEOs of these businesses. Um, and we focus within Intera focus in crop health, animal or crop science, animal health, and human nutrition are the core verticals. We look across the value chain and all of that. And, and like all venture, we kind of look at the growthier things. So biotech, digital, um, and, and given the early stage nature of, of our fund and the relatively smaller size, we ultimately aren't really investing in, in kind of pure assets or things of that sort. I want to go back to something you mentioned kind of midway, Brett, and that was that there's actually not that much capital flowing into the ag tech investment space. I feel like probably most folks in the audience have seen either like this CB Insights graph that goes like this or the pitch book one that goes like this and and would say like there's plenty 
of capital in ag and there's it's like doubling each year like that that comment that you just made probably doesn't jive with what we're seeing in like the media so um yeah. would love for you to just like explain what that looks like from your perspective yeah ha happy to and, and actually you know i don't always have all these numbers on the top of my head but i was doing something for an lp yesterday so um that's maybe why why these are the tip of my tongue um but it, it's it's all a relative basis right and, and so sure the interest in food and ag and, and you know the carbon interest which i think is a great thing i think we're going to talk about that a bit in terms of kind of what the focus at least in, in my view kevin's view we probably have a little bit different views but what that should be um but all of that is creating interest right from generalist investors ultimately um and so you've seen a significant increase in inflows of capital specifically in venture in venture funds so even when Antares started i didn't mention this but you know fund started about eight years ago. When Antara spun out of, and they spun out of Rabobank, um, the, the amount of VC funds in ag and food in general, and this is across ag and food, so both upstream and downstream, as Kevin was talking about, was it was about a billion dollars. Um, actually, Antara had a $60 million fund at the time that they launched, and that was like 20% of you know assets within the markets that we operated, which is just craziness, right? It has grown significantly, you know, now, at least in 2020, um, you know, based off of some pitch book data, um, you know, ultimately just under $20 billion um, in, in terms of the amount of VC funding in food and ag. And again, that's across the value chain of food and ag. That's biotech, digital, that's everything in there. Now, when you compare that to the size of the food and ag industry, which is, you know, there's all sorts of numbers out there, but that's a, you know, call it four to five trillion dollar industry, however you want to cut it up. Um, if not more, depending on what else you want to throw in. It's a small amount of money for innovation in a space that clearly hasn't had a lot of innovation because of what I was talking about earlier. There just wasn't a lot of investing in innovation. Um, and then when you think about the other spaces where a huge amount of money goes into, you know, software in 2020 had about $100 billion in VC funding. Bi you know, pharma, biotech, so human-oriented, and again, this doesn't include diagnostics. This doesn't. This is just pharma, biotech, was just under fifty billion. It was around forty-five billion. And ag, all of ag, is twenty, less than twenty. So that's what I mean by there's just not. It's an un in, underinvested space that's so critical to everything that everybody does every day. And you know, one of your panels even was you know, food as medicine or this medicinal medicine. Uh, medicinal food front like you know there's that old saying you are what you eat we've kind of lost sight of that i think over the generations but like you know there's a big aspect to health well-being everything in, in agriculture and, and obviously the upstream side growing the food that we need to eat and how we get it um so that that's a little maybe too much elaboration but just just the right amount of um, the elaboration there, I would say. Um, switching gears a little bit, Kevin, I'd love to hear more. You said 70% of your LPs are farmers. You are based in kind of the heartland or the Midwest. Um, and, and so would love to hear from your perspective. I'd imagine that's a competitive advantage and would love to hear kind of how you made the decision to solicit farmers as LPs and what you think might be different or unique or superior about um, about your placement in the country. Yeah, well, um, I'd like to say that it was the strategy that we originally set out to do, um, but as anyone who's gone through fundraising knows, um, you just sort of, you follow the wave. And uh, that's where we seem to get a lot of traction when we were out pitching fund one, uh, where just uh, actual farmers really understood uh, our message and, and our thesis and what we were looking to do. And what was neat on our side is <clears throat> these are these are folks that were already extremely innovative. I mean, we'd go on some of these farms and they'd be trying out 15 or 20 different technologies uh, just because they were really interested in, you know, how do I become more profitable, which I'll come back to, um, you know, how do I become more efficient uh, as an operation? And so, um, and so as we went out and fundraised, uh, that's where we got a lot of traction. And it's just like, I mean, when you think about the ag space, um, this is a trusted network kind of space, right? And so what happens is 
we got a couple of farms and then they told their friends and then we got a couple more farms and they told their friends and that's how it just continued to expand. And so when we looked at it, when we did our final close, um, it was neat to see that 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 70 percent of our of our investors were actual farmers. So they represent uh, they cover about 13 states throughout the Midwest. So think about sort of from to uh, Texas up to the Dakotas. Um, very heavy on the animal protein side. Um, and so uh, just to give you sort of an idea of what they represent, um, our LPs represent over three million head of cattle, uh, over one and a half million head of swine. Um, they've got very large dairy and poultry operations. Uh, they have about half a million acres of row crops. Uh, and then they're involved all throughout the supply chain. So ag retail, ag banking, um, uh, they've got ethanol plants, uh, ag trucking. So that that combination of all that they do, it took us a little while to figure out how to utilize that. But uh, we do think it provides us a little bit of a unique advantage or insight uh, as we look at deals, especially on the early stage side. Right. If we're focused on the upstream side, which are the technologies closer to the farmer, we now utilize this group. Uh, in a couple of different ways. I think one way that we utilize them is obviously to understand their pain points, uh, but we also need to understand very early on when we talk about different technologies that are interesting to us, how does it really work from sort of an integration and a scalability perspective for them? Um, and so they give us great insight there. When we uh, are in diligence, many times uh, this population will serve as trial sites for us. So again, we get to actually see whether the technology really works or doesn't, or what we get to really identify are where are the gaps in the technology and do we believe that those are gaps that can be addressed uh, with the existing management team and so forth? Are they within either the scientific or the technical realm uh, of possibility? And then once we make investments, um, we utilize the same group uh, to sort of accelerate the growth of some of these early stage companies, whether they serve as early customers, uh, just all depends on sort of the development uh, of the company at that point. So it uh, gives us a very unique sort of insight. Uh, one of the new things that we've started now is um, even before we've made an investment into a company, uh, we will bring together a subset uh, of that investor group and we will bring in uh, four or five companies that are going to pitch uh, that are all in a specific space. And so what we found is we get unique insight back uh, from our investors. Our investors get exposed to new technologies that are out there that maybe they haven't seen or heard of. But then from the early stage company perspective, they're excited about it because they get to spend 20, 30 minutes with their actual customer base. Um, and so they get excited because they say, hey, I'm I'm now creating a product that I'm targeting cattle and you've got two million head of cattle on this call uh, that's represented. So absolutely, I will make sure that I find a time in my schedule to to present to this group. So it actually ends up being uh, a win on all situations. And uh, I think one of the most intriguing things that I heard, uh, which I probably should have known anyway from one of our biggest investors was he said, you know, we made an investment in Fulcrum uh, to obviously get a financial return. But you have to understand when we calculate uh, sort of the ROI on this investment, it's not just the capital that you return from your fund. It's also the technologies that you introduce us to, whether you invest or not in them, that we then go back and implement on our large farming operations that save us eight or 10 percent on cost or um, allow us to uh, get more yield or whatever it may be. So they're looking at us from a return perspective of it's not just what on paper and what we actually distribute back to them in capital. It's also uh, some of the technologies that that uh, we give them access to or introduce them to uh, that make them more efficient in their operations as well. So it's sort of a it ends up being sort of a double bottom line benefit for them. Uh, and so as we go out and talk about what fun two looks like, uh, obviously, our goal is is to increase the amount uh, of farms that we have uh, that'll be LPs uh, and continue to grow that number because we do believe uh, it helps in terms of deal sourcing. We believe it helps in terms of uh, other syndicate partners like Brett's Group wanting us to be involved in deals where where that that population uh, is the, is the end customer or is heavily involved in in the technology. Um, so we'll look to try to grow that as we go into fund two. 
Great, thank you so much for sharing. And Brett, would love to hear from you um, what your relationship with your LPs is like, um, and then also the competitive benefit of being in Boston, which is you know an up and coming and maybe arguably established hub for ag tech, specifically with a lens to kind of biotech within. Yeah, yeah, it's great, and, and, and like I think on on you know some of the things that Kevin was talking about, you know, again, this is a unique space. Um, not, not just from some of the collaboration that we've already talked about, but yeah, you know, the the end consumer, especially when you think of upstream ag, you know, the end consumer, the farmer, is behaves differently than you we all do, right? And and so having those insights on how they're really purchasing technology or how they're really just behaving in the market is essential. And you know, we see so many times, and and really, it does take a a construct, you know, multidisciplinary, um, you know, approach to things, right? Because you want people from other industries, hence what I was saying about wanting generalists to come and put money here, right? We want people from tech, we want people from biotech, we want people from all walks of life to be thinking about how can I be an entrepreneur? How can I innovate in the agriculture and food space? But, you know, we see so many times where, you know, not to call out Palo Alto, but, you know, California Silicon Valley comes in and says, well, we're Silicon Valley. We know how to change everything um, on a digital front. Like food and ag, it's no different than anything else. It's, they're completely wrong. <laughs> and, and we've seen it, right? There's so many proof points of, of a bunch of different ventures that, um, you know, not because the technology wasn't sound, but because of the approach to the market, the business model, what have you. Um, you know, pricing, all of those various things that are embedded within any venture option, um, they just weren't appropriate for the consumer that they were targeting. Um, and so, you know, the, the insights that, that Kevin has, um, you know, again, make them an ideal partner for, for people like us because, you know, we don't have access to that. We, we rely on our, our own networks. And, um, you know, I used to drive around the Midwest doing primary research, you know, on Wall Street and, and still try to pull on that. But, but you know, the, the, the base that, Kevin has um, to just run those insights is, is invaluable. Um, in terms of our LPs, you know, obviously it's it's been really great. You know, one of the things that we've benefited a lot from is Rabobank um, and the research that they do and excel at in this space, right? And, and they think of any investment bank, if you will, and they do all sorts of things, right? As you know, lending, et cetera. So I don't want to call them specifically an investment bank, but um, Think of any bank and, and, you know, the amount of analysts they have that cover an individual sector, you know, depending on the size of that sector ranges from one to a handful. The Robo Bank has 100 agriculture and food analysts. <laughs> now, you know, is that too many? I'm not going to be one to say. Um, but, you know, they, they have two people specifically that, like, look at the salmon market, right, or, or, or things of the sort, right? So they're... they're depth of knowledge and just their depth of analysis within every aspect of this industry is, is you know unparalleled to anybody else and so and we have obviously access to that um, through through them as an LP and the, the strong relationship we have with them they also are co-investor with us in a, in a handful of things that we've invested in um, and and so you know again the, the key for us and what we've really benefited from and this comes even back to a thing my dad always told me when I started my own career um, and he built his in agriculture, he was like, are you sure you want to do ag? Because it just takes a long time. <laughs> so I, I you know, went around, he's a, he's a middle market operator, built out ag biotech, um, if you will. But ultimately I went the other way, I went into finance and thought, you know, innovation, thought maybe that moves faster. Well, in the end, it all needs to be proven out in the field. So as fast as the tech may move, the, you know, mother nature only goes so fast. Um, in terms of validating it all. So, you know, but, you know, that whole idea um, and what people who understand this space know that timelines are just different here. And so we have very long-term oriented patient capital behind us. And we think that's that's been absolutely critical in our success so far. And we believe that will be absolutely critical in our success going forward. And the other piece that I'll just mention about um, the great relationships we have with our LPs and I just mentioned this about Rabobank, but you know we've also had co-investments with Fidelity. We have co-investments already with some of the new LPs that we have. So not only is it a great way to um, continue to put money up to work in innovating in this space, the other piece is you know doing 
deals together also opens up the opportunity to bring LPs into funds. Um, so, is, and, and that, that will keep and continue as we move forward. I know you asked me something else, but being long-winded, I um, um, would love to hear a little bit about like what it's like to be in Boston um, yeah. from your perspective and that yeah. relationship. Yeah, um, and, and you know, I, I, Boston wasn't really on the map in this space um, up until I, I would argue that flagship put it on the map. Um, so I commend them for that. Uh, I did spend some time at a flagship family company, um, and. Uh, you know, they really have created an atmosphere here in Boston that is focused on food and ag um, and, and innovation there, even not just the biotech side, but the, the digital side. And they've really done a, a nice job given the life science oriented aspect. Um, and obviously digital is being pulled into everything now. Um, but that life science oriented aspect of Boston, um, you know, people realized as everyone gets more focused on their food, where it comes from, how they're eating, the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we, we've seen great success in people focused in human life sciences to kind of realize within their own lives that, you know, actually I'm a lot more interested in what I eat every day. And then like, how can I take the tools that I have learned and gained over the years and apply them to this space? And so it's growing and it's great. We'd love it to grow faster and, and be bigger, but that's always the case, right? Grow, grow more. Um, and and obviously we're we're hopeful in in being contributors or we are contributors there. A few of the the fund or the uh, ventures that we've created are here in the Northeast, um, in Boston and in the areas Connecticut, et cetera. So um, yeah, we we're <clears throat> it's growing and it's it's great. Um, you know, the, and that and that would actually brings up one one other idea just around kind of the innovation in the space. Um, you know, and in Terra's focus, right? So, you know, flagship does really great at, at tackling hard problems and trying to do things that ultimately kind of seem impossible at the time and then putting a great team around them and really working through those problems. And Terra, although, you know, that sounds interesting, we, we rather take de-risked technology from human pharma, if you will, and apply it to agriculture just a lot faster than what has traditionally happened. Because for the most part, ag it, you know lags kind of 15 20 years from the other industries and so we're just trying to bridge that gap a lot faster that's great and that actually tells into a great question from the audience my classmate caitlin asks how have your investment theses and approaches changed over time as you've gained experience and as you've gained experience in this space and worked towards maybe earlier stage companies um, and what what criteria do you think about when evaluating investment risk? And maybe Kevin, can you go first since we just heard from Brett? All right, yeah, I'll. Uh, you might have to remind me some of all what's in that question, but I would say uh, from a thesis perspective, um, I wouldn't say um, a lot has really changed. Um, I think there are definitely pieces that have been added to it. Um, and there are certain pieces that have received uh, that have become more highlighted, if you will. Um, so I'll give you a good example. We're in ag, we're in ag tech, and then we're in animal health. Um, and when I say animal health, we're on we're talking about production animals. Um, we have always been excited about the animal health sector. Uh, but just as Brett pointed out that there wasn't a lot of risk capital in ag, there's even less in terms of the animal health side. Um, and so while there have been a few exits that have been really massive, those have been companies that have been grown for quite a while uh, and have been uh, companies that are very substantial in terms of size and revenue and so forth. And so there just hasn't been enough from an exit uh, perspective on the animal health side for there to be a lot of risk capital on the early side. Uh, but when we originally talked about animal health from a thesis perspective, uh, it primarily involved uh, cattle, swine, uh, dairy, uh, and then poultry, right? Because that's what our investors made up. That's what we knew and so forth. I would say in the last 18 months, um, aquaculture would be a big part of now how we define animal health. And so um, we have not made an, uh, an aquaculture uh, investment yet, but uh, we've spent the last 18 months trying to get really smart uh, around not only aquaculture and the challenges within the industry, but then also 
um, the different partners that exist that are funding some of these early stage companies. And so I think our belief around sort of animal health, if you will, from a thesis perspective is it's similar to where ag was, call it five or seven years ago, where there wasn't as much risk capital involved. You're, you're betting on the fact that, that more capital is going to come into the sector as people learn a little bit more and you have some more growth of, of uh, some of these early stage companies that are solving massive problems. But the problems within or the challenges within animal health uh, are just as massive uh, as they are on the ag side. So when you start looking at some of these early diseases that are in animals that get around food safety and so forth, uh, whether it be on the aquaculture side or land-based animals, they, they're they're huge, they're massive, they're billion dollar issues. Uh, so I would say in general, like our thesis continues to expand. And then there are certain areas uh, that we get really, really interested in, uh, in cer at certain times. And so some of the some of the areas that we're intrigued about right now uh, that we think are still early um, are similar to like how people looked at the microbiome maybe a couple years ago. Everyone said, okay, that's fantastic. It's a great space. Uh, there are a lot of challenges with it, right? Repeatability and so forth. But we all understand and know that five to eight years from now, there are going to be tons of solutions that are microbiome driven. Uh, we feel the same way about sort of the nanotechnology space right now. Um, what we're seeing is this whole area of, of being able to be a carrier uh, for existing products that are out there uh, might help things like the biopesticide, bioherbicide uh, kind of area in ag to where they can be more competitive from a cost perspective than they are today um, when they compare themselves to traditional chemicals. So like, like nano, nanotechnology space is one that's really interesting to us right now. Um, when I look at from an ag perspective, uh, this whole area of automation uh, sort of on the farm, that's really interesting to us. And I know that's broad, but really what we're talking about is getting at uh, this issue of labor. Um, labor is going to continue to be a challenge in the ag space. And so uh, any technologies that are starting to get it at automation we're interested in, um, always interested in food safety. I mean, we've made several investments uh, all along this, uh, the value chain uh, from a food safety perspective. And then really, I would say there's a general theme under ag for us, uh, which is just farmer profitability. And so so we really dive heavily and deeply into the business models uh, of a lot of these early stage companies we're looking at to try to understand exactly from a quantifiable perspective, how is it making the farmer more profitable? Because ultimately, when we talk about changing farmer behavior, um, you need to talk about putting more money in their pocket. Um, I mean, not many of us are going to do anything just because we should do it. Um, and so uh, providing them more more money uh, at the end of the day seems to make sense. So from a thesis perspective, uh, I think because ours is broad and because it's global food production, uh, we don't think that typically changes much. Uh, but we go through this process about once a year where we sort of refine um, our thesis, if you will. And we just went through that process. And what we realize is that there's certain areas that get highlighted. Maybe it expands a little bit. Uh, but our areas of focus today are heavily on that animal health side uh, and then also on the ag side around sort of automation and kind of the soil health space seems to be where we're paying a lot of attention. Great. And then, yeah, then okay. And then, yeah, okay. I was just gonna say, I'll, I'll just add, add a, a few thoughts on, on that. You know, obviously there's uh, things that ebb and flow with, with the deal flow. Um, and so depending on the things that are coming in the door, um, there tends to be more interest. Just as an example, right? Like vertical farming, controlled environment, CAA, obviously SPAC mania has happened there. SPACs are of course shut off now because there are no pipes, but in general, you know, there was a lot of interest there. Um, and, and so, you know, you had a lot of focus, a lot of people saying, oh, well, I think I could do this just a little, little bit better, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think the, the things that are coming in the door constantly are changing depending on kind of how the industry is evolving or what the needs are, or what, what ultimately kind of happens in the market. Um, and so that obviously can impact the thesis and impact kind of the overall objective of what you're looking at investing in. Um, you know, again, we're just like Kevin, we kind of look across the space, we look at crops, we look at animal health, um, and it's kind of anything in there <laughs> oriented, oriented towards innovation, right? And again, limited because we're not going to go buy farmland. Um, we're not Bill Gates, unfortunately, um, and, and, you know, have the, the amounts of, of resources to go and buy farmland and then, you know, build out these, these mass asset heavy asset, um, investments. But, 
um, things that are driving innovation, it, it's constantly changing. So the thesis is constantly changing. And it's ultimately about trying to stay on top of it and trying to, you know, talk to the industry as much as possible, talking to as many entrepreneurs as possible. And, you know, and then for us too, there are times when we see kind of counter trend opportunities. And that's a lot of times when we will do, uh, you know, a venture creation, right? And, you know, Kevin raised the, the wonderful point in animal health that there's probably five of us that actually look at that space. Um, and so, you know, our biggest problem in animal health is not the lack of opportunity, the amount of innovation you can bring to it. It's the co-investors there. Right? The, there just aren't enough people to help fund what needs to be changed in animal health. Um, so, you know, production level, and then even as you move towards pets, even though pets is a lot, lot more funded because it's more, in the, you know, consumer oriented versus versus uh, you know on the farm. And and so, you know, we have invested. We've created five, three, sorry, three animal health businesses. Um, you know, that are somewhat counter cyclical, given the fact that there aren't a lot of people investing in edible health. <laughs> so we talked to Kevin a lot about it. Um, no, and, and ultimately, those are the things that, that we look at, because we do think as thematic investors, specialists in this space, that there are holes that people are not looking at. And, and, and here's one more example that I'll throw out there. Um, the biological space, extremely interesting. And, and Kevin brought it up as, as different methodologies into achieving um, success within the biological space. Um, we have made investments there, um, but we've also realized that there's a big problem innovating in synthetic chemistry. <clears throat> you know, just because glyphosate and, um, you know, Roundup and all of the other things are these big problem molecules doesn't mean that synthetic chemistry is a big problem, right? It's that there's no innovation there, right? The last herbicide that was found was 30 plus years ago. You know, which is craziness, right? We all take small molecule drugs every day on, at human health, right? Like that's all you're doing to a plant. And I get that there's a lot of issues, but it's not because crop chemistry is bad. It's because there's no innovation and the big chemical players don't innovate there. So we actually, with Bill and Melinda Gates, who invested in this, have started a innovative synthetic chemistry business called Ancochem. So, um, you know, to bring safer, more, invent more invent environmentally friendly and more effective crop chemistry. Um, and, and that all goes along together to Kevin's point about bringing profitability to farmers, because that's all that this really needs to be doing, is you know becomes an integrated pest management solution with biologicals, with other tools, so that farmers have better tools in their toolbox to manage the risks that they have in a given year, because farming is incredibly hard. I feel like that's a mic drop moment right there, Brett. <laughs> um, but we do have a couple more minutes, so I will take advantage of them. Um, we've kind of touched on this in a, in a couple of the conversations in the last 40 minutes, but would love to hear from both of your perspectives, generalist venture or kind of enterprise SaaS venture, What's the difference there between ag tech venture? Um, to me, it's quite clear, but would love to hear from y'all like the the big breakdowns in terms of these things might not be like they have the same name, which is venture capital, but they work pretty differently. Um, and so, Brett, you're off mic, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll list a couple and throw it over to Kevin. But, you know, the camaraderie, as I mentioned before, is a big, big difference. Um, you know, it, and I also, you know, again, not to just like keep harping on farmers. If, if you haven't gone out and talked to a farmer, you should because they're just wonderful people. Um, but in general, like it starts from farmers because upstream, that's who we're trying to help and impact. Right. Um, and they're, again, just wonderful people with a lot of optimism, doing a very hard job. And that just like filters through to the rest of us, you know? And so we're all pretty much like each other. Um, you know, there, there's, yeah. So so it's it's fun to work with each other. We, as mentioned, need to work together because of the limited amount of capital available to bring all the innovation that's necessary forward. Um, and, and then, you know, the other piece is, is and we kind of talked about it a little bit too, it's a unique space. Um, and, and so, you know, this space behaves very differently than some of the other venture-like groups. 
Um, and you just have to have that lens when you're approaching it. Um, and it's not that you can't bring tools from those other spaces into this and, and vice versa, take tools from here and bring them elsewhere, um, but they behave differently. Um, and so you always have to have kind of that, that different lens um, and know most importantly that timing is very different, venture investing in, in ag. Um, actually, uh, it was at one of the World Agritechs, um, but I remember Tomasic and SoftBank kind of got into it a little bit because SoftBank was like, we don't view this space as any different kind of an asset class. Like, it's the same timeline. Like, in four or five years, you know, like, we will have our exits. And you're like, you know, Tomasic stood up and, you know, was like, yeah, <laughs> you, you might want to check that again um, because – all of us know who operate and invest here that it does take longer. Yeah, I would say um, the only pieces I would add would be, I think when you look at sort of, you know, all of these technologies that are sort of in that, call it the SaaS bucket um, and how they're being applied to ag, I think um, the business models transfer, right? So, I mean, whether it was built for whatever industry, the actual business model of SaaS products will work in ag, I think, but there's two pieces that um, I think are important on any sort of SaaS kind of technology. I think one, um, the ROI has got to be absolutely clear um, and easily understood sort of for the farmer, right? If they're going to pay for it, they need to see that the value getting in return uh, is multiples of whatever that um, subscription fee or whatever it is that's, that's going to be for that model. Um, I think the second piece is what uh, Brett alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, you can't just build technology and assume it's going to be adopted in the ag space uh, because it's technology that works. There's tons of folks that have built incredible technology uh, that actually works in the ag space, uh, but people are not adopting. Farmers are not adopting it just because it works and it's cool. Um, they're, they've got enough data. What they're interested in is data that's going to actually help them drive efficiencies or drive more profitability. And again, that gets a little bit back to the ROI. So the point is, if you're going to build something in the SaaS space, build it with the, with the farmer in mind. I mean, and actually, in my opinion, work with the farmers as you look to sort of build this out. Because uh, again, this is part of the insight we think we get um, from our LP base in terms of uh, you know, how is this technology going to integrate with with my existing practices? Um, is it even scalable uh, based on how it has to be built for uh, the individual farmer to adopt it? So to me, those are two pieces that we really look at when we look at any sort of SaaS technology, um, because ultimately, yes, we know from a technological standpoint, it'll probably work because people have done incredible things with technology for the last 30 years. Uh, but the real question is, does it matter? Right. Does it matter to whoever the end consu consumer is or customer is? Uh, is it solving a big enough pain point? And is it easy? Are they is it easy for them to understand what the ROI is for them from a quantitative perspective where it's just a no brainer, quite uh, a no brainer answer on, on whether they should adopt it or not? Totally agree. I think we're just about out of time. So I'll end with a big thank you to both of you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Kevin. This has been such a treat to spend some time with you guys today. Um, and I know that uh, the rest of the folks um, on the internet would agree with me. So thank you both. Thank you for Absolutely. having me. Thanks, Kyla. All right, see ya. Bye. Bye.